This week, join me on an epic journey by air, land, and sea as I explore who really discovered North America. I'm going to follow the legend of two Viking explorers, Eric the Red and Leif the Lucky. Could these pioneering navigators have made it all the way across the Atlantic 500 years before Columbus? To find out, I'll sail a Viking ship in Denmark, explore ruins in Iceland, walk on the icebergs of Greenland, and ultimately set foot on the shores of the New World. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. At any second, this thing could flip and throw me in the water. I'm getting it, guys. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. According to the Viking sagas, it took Eric the Red and his son, Leif the Lucky, almost a lifetime to cross the Atlantic. Well, I don't have that kind of time, but my goal is to follow their trail and see what their epic journey might have been like. The Irish, the Welsh, and even the Chinese claim to have discovered America first, but the Vikings' claim is the most compelling. The Icelandic sagas recount the adventures of Viking explorers who, in their quest to exploit new lands, pushed farther west from their homelands of Scandinavia. Iceland was settled first in 860 AD, but after 100 years, most of the decent land was taken. Pushing even farther west, they discovered and settled a massive icy island they named Greenland. It's at this point that the Viking legends then make an extraordinary assertion. A Viking sailor named Leif the Lucky set out onto the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic and reached the American continent 500 years before Columbus. But could this legend really be true? To find out, I've come to the ancient Viking port of Roskilde in Denmark, where the largest collection of authentic Viking ships in the world has been reconstructed and preserved. What I've come to find out is did the Vikings have boats capable of crossing the open oceans? Marine archaeologist Anton Englert is going to show me the collection. This is a real Viking ship? Yes, it is. Where'd you get it? Well, it was excavated uh, 20 kilometers north of here, mm -hmm. um, half down the Roskilde Fjord. That's incredible. And do you have a date for when this ship was made? Well, uh, this ship in particular was built in the 1030s, and uh, the other ships were from the same period. We have reconstructed time by the time over 21 years, all uh, five ships. So we have them now just sailing out there. The reconstruction of this original. There's no guesswork in the replicas here. These ships sank and were protected over time by the deep mud at the bottom of the fjord. In fact, the ships were so well preserved, they enabled the team here to build the exact replicas they sail today. I'm going to meet Gunnar Eggertsen, Viking ship captain extraordinaire. He can show me how the Vikings constructed ships capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Nice to meet you. Same to you. They were able to row as fast as uh, at least eight knots. It's even creating air bubbles in the front to make it smoother through the waterline. They were surfing, more or less. Gunnar shows me that this boat was designed to flex with the waves. But this longship, the same type of ship that terrorized the coasts of northern Europe, would have broken into pieces if they tried to cross the Atlantic in it. That's why the Vikings designed a totally different ship for long voyages, like this one. So this is the cargo ship you were talking about? This is the cargo ship, yes. How would this ship compare at sea against the long ship? Why don't you find out? We are going to sail her. Gunnar is no stranger to sailing Viking ships. In 2000, he built this replica. Exactly 1,000 years after the Viking legends claim Leif the Lucky made the voyage, Gunnar sailed his ship from Iceland to North America. His 2,600-mile journey proved that Viking ships could cross the Atlantic. What can I do next? This ship, constructed from Norwegian pine, is as authentic as the vessel Gunnar built. Its sail was made using exactly the same technique the Vikings used. Square panels of woven wool were stitched together and treated with a tar-like resin. It covers an area of almost 1,000 square feet and weighs over half a ton. Life on a Viking vessel was physically demanding. This winch was the only mechanical aid on board. 
Brute strength was mandatory. And there she is. So is there any difference between what we just did and what the Vikings would have been doing a thousand years ago? No. Same thing. Same thing. Same sail, same ship, same movements. Yes. With a good wind, this ocean-going trading ship could reach 13 knots, about 15 miles per hour. It was designed to carry up to 24 tons of cargo, but only needed a crew of eight. But Gunner is more than just an accomplished sailor of Viking ships. Amazingly, a few years ago, he learned that he is directly related to Eric the Red and Leif Erikson. Uh, Leif Erikson's uh, grandfather was my great, 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 great 30 times grandfather. <laughs> That's a lot of greats. Yes. So you have records that go all the yeah, way back to all the way back. All the way back. We are going to tack into the wind. At the time of the Vikings, tacking into the wind was a revolutionary development. They had to rotate the sail and make a series of turns in a zigzag pattern. Although this was hard work, it enabled them to make headway even if the wind was blowing directly towards them. Let's go into the bow line. So the wind is coming at us this way? Yeah, we are about 45 degrees of wind. Isn't that one of the great things about Viking ships, that they could actually sail into the wind? Right, right. yes. And other ships at the time couldn't. Exactly. They were the only one on the oceans who, who could, and uh, almost the only one who were sailing across the ocean at that time. Good. Oh, we're turning. Uh, yeah, turning. Moving. 27 yeah. tons moving, turning. You're turning 27 tons I now. like the way that feels. Viking ships were more than capable of sailing the open ocean. Still, it took more than simple courage to leave home and set off into the unknown. They must have had some real motivation. These ships offered little protection from the fierce Atlantic weather. What is it about the culture at this time that's, that's leading them to go on these journeys to explore new lands? They found it uh, maybe a little bit too crowded in Norway and uh, because of high taxes over there. Everybody wanted to, to move to Iceland. Uh, uh, during 60 years, yeah. there were 30,000 people in Iceland who moved by Viking ships. 30,000 30, 30, people. Went on ships like this? Yes. We don't know how many ships made the voyage from Scandinavia to Iceland, but to transport 30,000 people, there must have been dozens of vessels making the journey. The Vikings tried to stay within sight of land. But to cross the Atlantic, they had to leave the safety of the shores and maintain a bearing across miles of open sea. Gunnar tells me that the magnetic compass wasn't introduced into Europe for another 200 years. So how did they do it? I put the question to Gunnar. How would the Vikings navigate if they were going to areas they didn't know? Uh, they were using the whole environment, you know, uh, birds, uh, whales, uh, clouds, currents, wind. Uh, stars, moon. Gunner's talking from experience. He made his own crossing of the Atlantic without modern gear, relying instead on clues from the environment, like the direction of the prevailing winds, the presence of whales and seabirds, and even the type of seaweed floating on the surface. Some people even believe the Vikings understood the relationship between the sun and latitude. This wooden disc, excavated from a Viking site in Greenland, may be a sun compass an instrument that would have been used to indicate if a vessel is holding its course. Sun compass or not, with a good wind, a Viking captain could sail the 600 miles to Iceland in four or five days. What about Eric the Red, your great, 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 great grandfather? Why did he leave Norway? Uh, he was uh, sort of a gangster. You know? He was uh, almost thrown out of Norway. He had to leave. A gangster? Sounds like Eric the Red had no choice but to get out of town. So from here, if I want to follow his trail, which is my goal, yeah. I'm going to Iceland. It would be Iceland, yes. OK. I can manage. I finally got this thing <laughs> figured out. Shouldn't take us long. In 960 AD, Eric the Red set out into the North Atlantic, heading for Iceland. And that's where I'm going next, to find Eric's longhouse in the wilds of Northwest Iceland. I 
on following the trail of Viking sailor Eric the Red, who left his Scandinavian homeland and pioneered a route across the Atlantic 1,000 years ago, 500 years before Columbus. In Denmark, I sailed a real Viking ship, and I learned that the Vikings had the technology to build ships capable of crossing thousands of miles of ocean. I also learned of a Viking sailor whose red hair matched his temper, Eric the Red. Outlawed from his homeland in 982 AD, he then set sail for a new life in Iceland. And that's where I've come to pick up his trail. Iceland is a large island, about the size of Kentucky. But much of the interior is uninhabitable. Most people, even today, still live on the coast. The story of Eric's life and times is captured in the Icelandic sagas, a unique and prized collection of oral histories. They can tell us a lot about the people who settled here 1,200 years ago. I'm going to meet an expert on the sagas at the very place they say Eric lived, 120 miles north of the capital, Reykjavik. But is it possible that a 1,000-year-old oral history could be that geographically accurate? Hello. According to my map, this is Eric's farm where Eric the Red lived. It's exciting, though. This is my first Viking longhouse. Gisli Sigurdsson from the University of Iceland has spent his entire career studying the Icelandic sagas. This is a great space. Welcome to Eric the Red's farm. This Thank is... you. So is it okay if I so please explore? This stuff hanging here. These are well, these are actual Viking period tools. These are the not only living but also wor working quarters here. So people would be doing all this stuff inside these walls. Oh, look, so, so these weapons, is this, this is a Viking sword? Yeah, all uh, authentic replicas of uh, Viking tools. And then this is a Viking helmet. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have all that many of those in the archaeology, but a few, at least enough to prove that they didn't have any horns on them. How come no horns? Uh, I think uh, sir, Wagner's operas introduced the idea of horned helmets into the culture. So that's a myth? Yeah. That's Vikings right. didn't have horned helmets? No. I, either something like this or even just leather helmets. Yeah? Okay. So this, this would be a very um, elaborate <laughs> version of what they could, uh, could have used. Wow. It's not easy to fit. Does that look like a Viking? It uh, may not uh, be exactly your size. No. <laughs> you would need a larger size, I think. All right. But still, I get the point. This is a battle yeah. helmet. Well, yeah. Yes. This is, a, I mean, it's, it's a comfortable space. It was, mm -hmm. It's much warmer. It's a little bit smoky, but it's warm in here, even though outside it's wet oh, and yeah. windy. So, so in, inside this uh, house here, we would have uh, between 20 and 30 people sleeping. 20 to 30 people sleeping in this room? Yeah. How about the sod? I noticed as I was coming in that the exterior is all dirt. Yeah. Is there a way you can show me from the inside how that was done? Yeah, we have in the kitchen area here a nice, nice turf wall that okay. you can see. Geesley tells me that this 60-foot-long, 20-foot-wide structure was typical of the time. Wood was scarce and was used to build only the frame. The Vikings made extensive use of sod for the exterior. Up to six feet thick, it was excellent insulation against the freezing winters. Once you have the door locked and the fire burning inside, you can be uh, comfortable sure, on the which inside. We do. So maybe we'll go to the fire and I can ask you a lot more questions about the Vikings. Tell if you saw us in there. Yes, excellent. So, I'm told that you are the saga man. Yeah, I work with the sagas, anyhow. Yeah? So tell no. me about the sagas. What can we learn about the Vikings from them? There's plenty of evidence about the Vikings and the settlement of Iceland in the sagas that were written here in the uh, 13th, 14th centuries. Geesley says the sagas were not written by eyewitnesses. Rather, they were transcriptions of oral accounts of remarkable events which took place as much as 200 years earlier. What do the sagas tell us about Eric the Red specifically? There is a saga named after him, and then another called the sagas of, saga of the Greenlanders. The sagas tell that Eric came to this area and married the daughter of a local farmer. He gave them land in this valley where Eric built his farm. So the sagas actually say, and that archaeology comes in and confirms that the land here has the same names and the, and the artifacts date to the same period of time. Yeah, so we have uh, evidence, narrative evidence, 
uh, of uh, Eirik coming here to this area with the place names and all. And uh, this is where um, the story tells us that he built his farm. The sagas appear to be remarkably accurate. Archaeologists have been able to prove that this was not only the area of Eric's farm, but the outline of walls found just behind the reconstruction are the actual ruins of Eric's house. But Geesley explains that Eric wasn't given the best piece of real estate when he married the farmer's daughter. It was on the edge of the family land and very close to the neighboring farm. Eric wasn't here long before he was on the losing end of a violent land dispute. He was declared an outlaw once again. Regardless of how he actually got convicted, mm. what, what happens after he's an outlaw? Then uh, he has to move fairly swiftly, move out of the country, because then anyone can uh, get him in between. Kill him? Yeah. Eric had already been exiled from the Viking homelands in Scandinavia, so he has no choice but to keep going west. There were rumors of a land spotted by a sailor who'd been blown off course. With nowhere else to go, Eric decides to find and settle this new land. He convinces some of his family and friends to join him with the promise of getting rich trading its resources. Eric the Red set off to Greenland with over 20 ships and a lot of people who didn't know what they were in for. I'm not going by ship, I'm going by plane, but I'm still excited to go to Greenland. Even today, it's not easy to reach the remote southwest of Greenland. It's going to take three days, four planes, two helicopters, and a boat. Once there, I'll search for evidence that Eric and his followers really made this cold, barren land their home. I'm following the trail of Viking sailor Eric the Red, a man who seemed to have a knack for getting himself thrown out of town. In 985 AD, under penalty of death, he left his home in Iceland and set off to found a new colony on the huge icy land to the west, Greenland. Today, even with airplanes, getting to southern Greenland isn't much easier. The first step is a three-hour flight to Kulusuk on the eastern side of the country. From the relative warmth and safety of the plane, I can't help but notice a very cold-looking sea filled with icebergs below. Eric's journey must have been treacherous, requiring a mixture of determination, skill, and luck. Only 14 of the 25 ships that left with Eric made it. The rest either turned back or were lost at sea. As I approach Greenland, I'm really excited. It's one of those places you never think you'll actually visit. So this is Greenland. I think I would have named it Rockland or Snowland. I don't think I would have picked Greenland. I think Eric the Red was selling it a bit. I think he was full of creativity. But this place is nowhere near my destination. There's still well over 1,000 miles of snow and ice to cross. This tiny airport is a mere stepping stone to the more populated west coast of Greenland. I've flown from Reykjavik to Kulusuk. Now, my goal is to fly, skirting the Arctic Circle, to Nuuk, the capital. Then I'll catch another plane to where Eric the Red settled in the south. But wait, there's more. A lot more. Greenland is huge. It's over 860,000 square miles. That's more than three times the size of Texas. And all this land is inhabited by only 55,000 people. But it's down here where the Vikings settled. Why? So I'm going to find out when I get there. As soon as we take off, we're over the glacier and ice fields, which cover the majority of this huge island. If all the ice here melted, sea levels worldwide would rise almost 20 feet. After another three hours, ice gives way to rock, and I reach Nuke, the capital. After a brief stopover, it's onto an even smaller plane to the south. But now I have company. And I'm now checking in for the flight to Narsarswak. And the expert joining me for this leg, Carolina Paulson. And we're heading down there to look at Eric the Red's settlement. 
Carolina moved here from Denmark to study the Viking settlements, and she's gonna be my guide in Greenland. We've got this tiny plane to ourselves for our flight down south. From Nuuk, we're flying 400 miles to Narsarswak, the area Eric chose to settle. As we approach our destination, Carolina points out that the area we're flying over is called Eriksfjord. This is the land that Eric and his followers first settled in Greenland. You see, it's so much greener here. The land looks a lot more fertile. So Greenland is green. Yeah, can be, can yeah. be. That was great. But look, we went from the big plane to get to Nuke and now the little tiny plane to get here. And then to a helicopter. No, really? <laughs> yeah? To Clagger Dock. <laughs> Why not? One more to go. Oh, it's not just a helicopter, it's just the course team. We're almost there. Only one more helicopter to go. But the journey has been worth it. The landscape is amazing. But even today, this is a challenging place to live. There are no roads or railways. The only way to get between most of the isolated settlements is to fly. We're finally getting close. Reykjavik to Krakadok. Four airplanes, two helicopters, and we're here. Piece of cake. After 12 hours of traveling from Iceland, we're finally in the area the Viking settlers called home. But the best preserved evidence of their lives is still a boat ride and hike away. Good morning. We had a great night in Korkardok? Krakadok. Krakadok. Yeah. And now we're off to see the Norse settlements in the area. Which is actually that way in the bottom of the fjord. Which is that way. That way. But we're going this way to see that. My first iceberg. That is cool. Seeing an iceberg for the first time is an awesome experience. The beauty of the deep blue ice has to be seen to be believed. After our short detour, it's back on the trail. Valse, the place we're heading, is a two-day hike from the nearest settlement. So tonight, we're gonna be camping out. We're taking a boat part of the way, but we still have a long trek ahead of us. Look at that, a piece of driftwood. The fact that wood is on an island that has so many trees, that's significant, right? Yeah, it would be from Siberia, Canada, North America, Europe, somewhere. And would, if the Norse settlers found something like this, they would use it to build? They would use it. What about these crazy bugs? <laughs> Were they here a thousand years ago? Probably, yeah. Oh, really? When it's not windy. Yeah, that's true. When it's warm. Mm -hmm. Let, me Let me help you out there. Carolina tells me that this whole area would have looked very similar when the first settlers arrived here over a thousand years ago. This is sort of the central place of the eastern settlement. It's a rather large settlement there, and you can actually see the home, the buildings. So Let's get to it. That's... Although this land is green and lush, there is still not that much flat land to raise the animals they brought from Iceland. They had to select their site carefully. So that's it out there. The flatland, there. Where that ridge comes down to the yeah. fjord. It's perfect for farming down there. Had a preference of living in ice. It takes us another three hours to get down to the ruins. As we walk, Carolina tells me that there are Viking sites scattered throughout this area. But the place she's taking me to is the latest and best preserved. She's involved in ongoing archaeological work to learn more about their lives here and why they mysteriously disappeared. So these are the rooms here? Yep. What was each room used for? That's different purposes, um, like one for sleeping, one for cooking. But this was all one family? Yes. Yeah. This is a big place. It's a very big place. 
This site and several others have been excavated, and we have a fairly good idea about the settlers' lives. They had cattle for dairy products and sheep for wool. Fish was a staple of their diet. In the summer, they went on hunting trips farther north. Carolina wanted me to see this site not only because it is so well preserved, but because it was Eric the Red who first discovered it. Ultimately, he chose to live somewhere else, and he gave this land to his cousin. That hole up there, that indicates that this place was rather important. Only three farms in Greenland has a, a hole like that. So it definitely indicates that this person here was... Rich. Rich. Yeah. And so does the church over there. Valse Church is one of the best preserved Viking buildings anywhere. It was built when Christian missionaries came to Greenland from Scandinavia in the 12th century, 200 years after Eric and the first settlers arrived. Great stonework. Yep. You see, the inside of the church is not as smooth as the outside. Oh, it's better out here, huh? Yeah, it's better outside. Well, it actually is. Yeah. So they didn't have to have as, as good craftsmanship in here. Yeah. Okay. Right. That over there, the altar would have been under that window. Mm -hmm. You can see the window with the arch in it. it. Sort of really copies the European style. Just that this is made with arch-shaped stone, so it would have been very difficult to make it. He yeah. said that was over the altar? Yeah. Is this place still considered an active church? Yeah, you can get married and baptized and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. Probably take this off. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my bad. Carolina tells me that the last record of a Viking event on Greenland was a wedding in this very church in 1408, just before the colonists mysteriously disappeared. No one knows for sure why the settlement was abandoned, but Carolina has some theories. So this here is basically the last holdout. Yeah. Any idea what led to their decline? Climate changes, um, difficulties to import things, um, no boats coming here from Europe, mm -hmm. and nothing to trade with. But going back to then to Eric the Red and the time I'm focusing on, from here, Eric, who had scattered all this land, he actually picked an even more beautiful place. Yeah, he did. Right, well, that's where we're gonna go? Yep. After we go have dinner and, and sleep here for the night? Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do it. Archaeologists continue to debate the exact reason why the Viking settlement on Greenland was abandoned. But there's no doubt about where Eric the Red established his settlement 400 years before. And it's this place and period that's at the heart of my quest. Now we are uh, enjoying nighttime because it's well after 11 o'clock and it's still bright. And that's normal? Yeah. Yeah. The sun doesn't set. Not this time of year. Nope. So this is dark and we're having our campfire, and then we're gonna go sleep, and tomorrow, we see where Eric the Red actually settled. And I've heard it's the prime real estate of the area. It is. We're just gonna wait for the fire to die down a bit, and then call it a night. Pick it up tomorrow. In the morning, we'll see just how treacherous navigating Greenland's waters can be. And learn how Eric's son, Leif, embarked on the most dangerous section of the Atlantic crossing. I'm on an adventure across the Atlantic in the wake of the most famous Viking explorer, Eric the Red. So far, I've learned how Eric sailed the Atlantic from mainland Europe to Iceland. He was soon banished from there and became the first person to explore and settle the enormous icy expanse of Greenland. I've now traveled across the whole country and seen that the land which greeted the first settlers is just as magnificent today as it was then. I've also seen how developed the Viking settlement of Greenland became. Archaeologists believe the total population reached over 2,000 people. Initially, the weather was warm enough for farming, but experts believe that progressively colder temperatures contributed to the eventual disappearance of the colony from Greenland. Could ask for a more beautiful morning. We know from the Greenland sagas that about 450 people made this area their home. We even know where Eric the Red himself lived, and that's where we're going next. Time to hit the trail.
The area that Eric chose for his home is 20 miles from where we camped. He settled in the next fjord, which now bears his name. As we hike, Carolina tells me that it wasn't until the early 20th century that archaeologists discovered the Viking settlements. So this is Eric's fjord here. This is awesome. Look at all these icebergs. Yeah. As the icebergs drift out to sea, they melt and break up. The explosive cracking can be heard throughout the fjord. That's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Eric the Red's farm is at the far end of the fjord, and we've still got to get past hundreds of these icebergs. This really is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. But we have to remember that to the first settlers, this must also have been a very lonely and forbidding place. And in the winter, it's a tough place to survive, even today. Look at seal. He's just basking in the sunlight. Can't blame him. The Vikings hunted seals, walrus, and narwhal not only for food, but for trade. Their fur and hides and the narwhal's ivory tusk were highly prized back home. But when elephant ivory was introduced to Europe, the demand for the Viking's ivory decreased, and with it, a vital source of income was lost. That was pretty cool, though. We were that close. That close. These icebergs may look beautiful to you and me, but to the 24 ships that set off with Eric to cross from Iceland to Greenland, they would have been a real danger. Still, I can't resist the temptation to get closer. I asked the captain if I can walk on one of these unstable chunks of ice. He says he'll try to find one flat enough for me to stand on, but cautions me that if I fall into the water, I'd only have a few minutes to get back on the ship before I freeze. You don't even have to be very close. Icebergs can implode or capsize at any time, sending huge blocks of ice flying. I don't, I don't, oh, back, 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 back. This is a relatively small one. But as we touch the berg, I'm having second thoughts about getting on it. But here I go. Seven eighths of the iceberg's mass is below the waterline. At any second, this thing could flip and throw me in the water. Come get me, guys. Because it's out of bounds. <laughs> Not what I want to hear. Come on. <laughs> OK, enough of this iceberg stuff. All right. Ta -da. OK, host on board. Jolly good character. <laughs> You know when you get like so worked up you can't even talk right? It's kind of like that. It was a brief but worthwhile experience. It's taken me three days and half a dozen flights to get here from Iceland. I'm hoping now to finally see the place that Eric chose to call home on this immense isolated island on the edge of the known world. It wasn't until the 1930s that the ruins here at Bratelid were identified as Eric the Red's farm. And since then, it's been thoroughly excavated. Parts of it have been reconstructed. So for an outlaw in exile, Eric the Red did pretty well for himself here. Yeah, he did. Actually, they've tested the soil here, and it's the best spot for farming. Was there anything about this location other than the fertile soil that would have been an advantage for him? Yeah, it's central for the eastern settlement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also has a good harbor. So what's it like, then, if Eric the Red has come this far does he decide, OK, I'm here, time for family, or does he keep training and traveling? No, he settles here with mm. family. Uh, Life, the oldest one, is mentioned in Iceland. But the next three kids he have, they're born here. here. Carolina tells me that Eric's settling down here coincided with the introduction of Christianity from mainland Europe. Actually, there's a story telling uh, about Eric, and they convince Trollhilde Eric's wife to be a Christian, mm -hmm. and she wants a church built here. Mm -hmm. But Eric refuses to have it built. So she sort of refused to have anything to do with him. So she wouldn't sleep with him? No, until the church was built. So he picked up a rug and he threw it as far away from the farm he could. And where that rug landed, they built a church. And 
It could have been very similar to this. This is a reconstruction out of the This is what the church might have looked like? Yeah, oh. it is. Let's go in. About the time this small church was being built, the character of the Vikings began to change across all the lands they had settled. Many began to convert to Christianity. Leif was an early convert and personified the new Vikings. He inherited his father's spirit of adventure, but spurned his savage and superstitious ways. According to the sagas, Leif was a golden Viking, describing him as a big, strapping fellow, thoughtful and temperate in all things, as well as highly respected. He became a skilled sailor, taking cargoes to Iceland and Scandinavia from his father's settlement here in Greenland. He got the name Leif the Lucky after he rescued a shipwrecked crew and claimed their entire cargo. Wow, so I'm guessing this would have been the center of his house, and this, should come a long way to see, would be the best view in Greenland. It's been a very long journey to reach Eric and Leif's last home here on Greenland. Standing in the ruins of Eric's actual house, I learned that this is where Eric's epic journey finally ended. Leif picks up where his father left. <laughs> He had heard rumors about the land west of here. So Eric heard that there's even more land to the west, and what does he decide to do? Actually, Leif heard it. He, okay. was, he was the one most keen of it. He buys his ship, and he convinces more than 30 men to follow him. So if I wanted to go and follow in Leif the Lucky's footsteps, yeah. where would I go from here? To Newfoundland. Then that's where I'm going to go. At this point in this epic story, father makes way for son. From here on, this is Leif's journey. In 1001 AD, Leif Erikson left this ferry fjord on a ship with 35 men. No real maps or charts, and no sense of where they were going or what they would find. Did Leif the Lucky really make it to America? Join me as I complete my crossing of the Atlantic and search for the archaeological evidence that could prove the epic saga of the Viking explorers is no myth. I followed the Viking explorers across the Atlantic. I'm trying to uncover the truth of their adventures as told in the Icelandic sagas. I've seen proof that the Vikings colonized both Iceland and Greenland. But the most incredible saga says in 1001 AD, Leif the Lucky made a treacherous journey across the North Atlantic and discovered North America 500 years before Columbus. I'm now approaching the northern end of Newfoundland. It's about 1,000 miles from Greenland to here, and this could be the end of the Viking Trail, which I've been following. Some say that 1,000 years ago, Leif the Lucky and his expedition touched down for the first time on these shores in what I can only imagine was a moment of pride and exhilaration. The Greenlander saga says that Leif encountered Baffin Island, which he named Heluland. Then he headed south, coasting along Labrador, which he called Markland. Finally, he landed on the northern tip of Newfoundland, which he called Vinland, because somewhere here they claim to have found grapes. So far, I've been able to find evidence that the voyages described in the Icelandic sagas are true. But oral sagas can't always be relied upon as factual documents. There are many tales and legends of ancient mariners reaching America. The Welsh, the Irish, even the Chinese all claim to have gotten here first but no archaeological proof that any of them actually did has ever been found on the American continent. Is the Viking claim any different? Let's go find out. At the northern tip of Newfoundland is a place called Lonsa Meadow. A small settlement of turf buildings has been reconstructed here on a site long thought to have been a native Indian camp. Dale Wells is the curator of the site. The ruins here at Lansa Meadows were discovered by Dr. Al Gingsted from Oslo, Norway. It was on a quest to find the Vinland of the sagas. Um, he came here inquiring about ruins. And the local fishermen brought him here, showing, telling him that they would, he would bring him to the Indian camps that were at Black Duck Brook. To these, this was the Indian camps? This was what the local people thought were the remnants of Indian camps. They thought native peoples had inhabited this area, which of course they did, but these ruins are not related to the natives. It's interesting, because it, it doesn't look like an Indian camp to me. You know, no. Just based on my limited experience so far, these, these long, thick walls, there's, there's, there's a lot of walls around here. This looks to me more Icelandic or Greenlandic 
the Native Absolutely. American. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And that's the same thing that Dr. Ingstad suspected. When he saw them, they looked familiar to him as well. Can you give me a tour and tell me what's what? Sure. Dale tells me that this site was discovered in 1960 and later reconstructed. It certainly looks very similar to the other Norse settlements I've seen in both Iceland and Greenland. But I'm here for real proof that the sagas are true. From the archaeological evidence, the carbon-14 datings that have been done on the materials that were taken from this site, it dates back approximately a thousand years. So this would be, according to the sagas, the same time that Leif the Lucky is actually coming here. That's right. The, according to the sagas, the Vinland voyages would have began about the year 998, the year 1000, in that vicinity. And this site does date back to approximately the same period. What kind of evidence is being dated? Uh, a lot of the wooden artifacts that were retrieved from the site, uh, materials dealing with ship repair, charcoal, that was used in the uh, production of iron here. So uh, they actually had iron here? It's the first place in North America that any iron works are known to have taken place. And they smelted it in a furnace to produce good workable iron, which here at Lonson Meadows was used to produce rivets or nails for ship repair. And the Native American cultures, we know, were not doing any kind of iron work at this Absolutely time. Absolutely not. So no. this, this again speaks this. to the relationship between this place and other Norse villages. That's right. That's okay, right. so the dimensions of this space, the fact that there's iron here, both say Norse. What else? There were a number of artifacts found here that relate directly to the Norse culture. Uh, for example, they found a bronze ring at its pin, which was used as a cloak pin to hold the cloak over the shoulder. Um, they also found a spindle whorl, a little round soapstone object that was used at the end of a drop spindle for spinning wool into yarn. Okay, another Norse or Icelandic. Another Norse or Icelandic object. But it wasn't until after the archaeological work was completed, of course, the evidence was there. The archaeological evidence proves that Vikings lived here at the very northeast of the American continent, now part of Canada. But did they explore farther south in what's now the United States? Archaeologists have looked for other Viking settlements and found nothing. The proof that they explored farther south came from an amazing piece of archaeological detective work. The butternut tree grows in the northern United States and southern Canada. It's never grown as far north as the Viking camp at Lonsa Meadows. We found butternuts on the archaeological site, on the Norris layer. And these don't grow around here? No. They never have? They never have. So someone went a long ways to gather this, and then somehow it fell. Archaeologists are convinced that these butternuts were brought here by the Vikings. They were excavated from the same level as the Viking ruins. And there's no evidence that the Vikings were trading with the natives at the time. So if this is their base camp, and they're using this spot to explore the region, how far are they traveling? Well, well, they went well into the Gulf of St. Lawrence region, at least as far south as New Brunswick. The butternut proves that they explored well into southern Canada, and probably into the northern United States. We also know from the archaeology that the Vikings stayed here for only two or three years. But why? The materials that they were taking back with them to Greenland was already available to them through tra trade routes with Europe. Um, this is a long way for them to go. Mm -hmm. So it may not have been worth their effort to continue to come here. The Vikings certainly had the technology and the courage to reach North America. But 1,000 years ago, it seemed to them that there was nothing here which they couldn't get at home. And so they left. Any sign that they were ever here soon disappeared for almost 1,000 years. In fact, if Eric the Red and Leif the Lucky's tales had not been recorded in the Viking sagas, archaeologists would have never known to look for them on the American continent. But today, the evidence is undeniable. A Viking ship explored the coastline of North America 500 years before Christopher Columbus. <laughs>